Okay. Okay, welcome everyone. We are live on, on Facebook now. And we're so thankful that everyone is tuning in or you're about to tune in. If you want to be a part of the conversation directly, you can log into the Zoom with us. We're having a very interesting, hot conversation. This is pro this by far is one of my favorite topics of all time because no one can say I was talking about Jara, I was talking about Brenda. This is a public comment. Uh, this is an agenda item, y'all. So this gives freedom and reign. And I'm really excited to um, hear what our um, guests have to say. Um, again, I'm Camila Bywaters. I'm running for the Board of School Trustees in District E. And I have some of my wonderful mentors and friends on the line. And we are really excited to um, join you today. We missed last week. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let co-host go ahead and introduce himself and we'll just get started. And remember, if you want to join the Zoom, you can. And we really would like to hear from our community. Listen, if you have never wanted, if you have never had opportunity to say something about Superintendent Jara, this is your time. It is an agenda item. If you had never had an opportunity to say something about Brenda Larson Mitchell, I'm not saying negatively or anything like that, but whatever your thoughts are. It's an agenda item. So come on and let's talk about this. Let's have a conversation. And it's really important that we hear from the community and see what your thoughts are on the topic. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Camila Bywaters and Rodney Smith here with some guests. And we're going to talk about some school issues. But these are some issues that we have been talking about pretty much ever since he's gotten here. And that is Superintendent Jara. But in this particular instance, is Superintendent Jara wanting to leave? Imagine that. Um, so my name is Rodney Smith, big fan of Sister Camila Bywaters, who's running for school board trustee District E. And she is doing something tonight that she will continue to do once you elect her to be your school board trustee. And that's interact directly with the people every week you'll get a chance to talk directly to her about your issues. And she is practicing doing it now by doing it so she can carry it on once she is elected. So you all call in, dial in, type in, do whatever you need to do to share your thoughts and opinions here in the Zoom or on Facebook Live. Let's get busy tonight on Superintendent Jara. What's he doing? Why is he doing it? Where is he going? What should we do? Should we just let him go? Hmm, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah, um, so since Wednesday, hold on. I had to, okay, Jasiri started, I don't know what he was doing in the background, but. Um, this is live, y'all. Yeah, I know, this right? Is this is totally live. live. Since last Wednesday, I think, I can't remember what I was doing last Wednesday, but I was engaged in something. Oh, I was doing fundraising calls. And all of a sudden, across my phone, I saw the news break that Superintendent Jar was submitting his resignation. And I it, it I literally about fell out my chair. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, my goodness. My I was like, OK, I got to stay focused on my fundraising calls because that's very important. I couldn't concentrate. My consultant was like, Camila, you OK? I was like, no, I'm falling. I'm falling. <laughs> <laughs> and. But it was interesting because like, well, you know what? We need to pay attention because there's something else happening that I don't think the wider community was paying attention to was that even though there was this resignation happening, it was like a, a doorstop, like, no, but we're going to appoint as superintendent Brenda Larson Mitchell. So it was just like, I would have felt if I was in a bus, I would have fell out of it. It was just all over the place. And I think like our whole city, the state of Nevada, was like in a rock in a hard place. Um, I don't know what your what you all's initial thoughts were. Mm, well, I can tell you that my first thought was this is a man who was fired, fought to get rehired, got rehired by the school board, got a huge pay raise in the process then got one of the best contracts that you could ever get. So if he ever was forced out, the district would have to pay him 
like $2 million. Imagine that as a golden parachute. And this is not even a Fortune 500 business. This is a school district, some, something that spends money, doesn't make money. And so my first question was, why now? And just, first of all, just why? And then second of all, why now? And this was right around the same time that the report had come out about the videotape of the officers, um, I say harassing some students outside of Durango High School that the superintendent said that once we saw this video, it would exonerate those officers as if he had seen it already. But the peculiar thing was when the community asked to see the video, all of a sudden we couldn't see it. There's privacy issues, then there was the cause of sort of blurring out images. There was a whole bunch of reasons on why we couldn't see this video. And lo and behold, the video gets released after, after a suit by the Sun newspaper. Come to find out, the officers lie. The officers lie. Superintendent Jara backed those officers up. The chief of police of the school district hired by Jara backed those officers up. So my first question was why, why now? And then did anything about the release of these videos have something to do with him deciding to jump ship now? Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else have any ideas or thoughts? Because there, there's a lot of different theories. So this is where I'm like, y'all have heard me say, this is CCSD love and hip hop style. So <laughs> it's a lot of different theories going on out here. Martin, did you have any initial thoughts? You're on mute. Here we go. I thought I could have sworn I could have. Okay. My first initial thought was it's about, I'll say darn time since we lied. <laughs> um, after all these years that um, I've, my level of involvement is, is pales in comparison to yours, but I have been involved as you, as you know, and, and after years of listening to the, lack of safety or un unsafe conditions teachers are in, um, the, the poor treatment of people coming to the board, uh, to the board meetings and the low and, and not seeing any movement in our academic achievement level at any level. And then not only does this person get his job back, but he gets a raise. Who does that? And based on what? <laughs> and the only, uh, the only thing that can come to mind is Either some type, I'm, I'm not making any type of accusation whatsoever, but there has to be something nefarious, whether it's you know going on that's it's that's that's uh, unethical and it and and might even be criminal. I don't know. I don't know anything to say to make an accusation, but something is not right with this picture. Allegedly. So allegedly, <laughs> I, I, I have absolutely nothing to base anything that opinion on, but. I've been around long enough to know where there's smoke. There's got to be some fire somewhere. And then I see that there's an investigation that uh, uh, not a for that that information act. Uh, 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 FOIA. The, the FOIA the FOIA uh, found, and there's some things that he said some some things about um, someone being a mistress and things like that 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 was not cool. <laughs> and so the timing, going back to the why now, the timing culminates to something is not right to where usually people say the person gets fired but they say this person has decided to resign and focus on their family type of situation so yeah but we'll see i look forward to hearing what happens tomorrow night yeah i, I do too miss amy did you have any initial thoughts my initial thought is I, I heard long time ago that once a superintendent's go to a district, stay at least five years. And I was just reading, I guess he was in Florida for six years. And this is the beginning of his six year here. Once they put in five years, they get a lifetime uh, pension from those districts. And I'm, that's the last several um, superintendents that Clark County have hired. They stay five years and they're gone. Right. So that was my initial thing was that's, he, when he got fired, he might've been a little bit short, 
I'm not sure. Yes. And so he had to get his job back to stay long enough so now he can retire and get his pension. Yeah. And and let's talk about that pension a little bit, because this is not just a pension that you and I get. This is a quite lucrative pension. Um, the financial portion of it alone is like he's still working, but he's getting paid. Uh, he's a relatively young man, so to speak. So that means that we would be paying someone. There would be someone on the Clark County School District payroll possibly for another 20, 30 years, who only served six years in this district? I mean, how many people do we have on the Clark County School District payroll now who have served these six years? I mean, we how, how many people are we going to pay like this? And this is something that I think that the school board should look at is the compensation package for these folks that come in, maybe some type of colliding scale package for the longer that they stay. That, you know, maybe they start out with a little less and each year they get an increase instead of just giving them a huge increase when they come in because of course everyone gets paid more than the last guy and Jara gets paid as my, my understanding more than the governor. So not that I think the governor is doing a great job, but if you're getting paid more than the head of the state, there should be some results in commensurate with that pay. And that's something that I haven't seen. Yeah. And I think you, you're bringing up a really good point about those results. Um, if you all don't know, I am the president of Lavapsi. Tracy is the president of or the vice president of Lavapsi. And we've always said, like, listen, there's no way we can continue to pay um beyond like six figures for people uh, you know almost 400,000 and all their benefits and perks and they're not bringing results like every person i know that works you have to have some type of results or you're not going to be working at your job um i just think that we um we're in a intentional pickle because we've had trustees Lola Brooks, Evelyn Garcia Morales um, Bustamante and, um, what's the other one's name? And Katie, <laughs> who Katie have really been supporting, uh, the superintendent's agenda. Now, what I remember is that the superintendent is the, uh, the, the trustees are, are to have informed oversight and are supposed to supervise the superintendent. But these policies um, were changed. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to, um, this is a big shout out to former trustee Danielle Ford. She does a really good job as a person who's been on the board. She shares her experiences. She does a really good job of kind of explaining and bringing this all to people so you understand. This, is, this has been a work in progress, okay? This has been a big, this this is this this is what the status quo looks like in education. Okay, it's all designed to ensure that the community is not involved, the students aren't involved, their families and educational stakeholders are not involved. And then here we are, at you know we have a superintendent who's planning to resign, who wants to be bought out, didn't bring any results, and then the audacity. In what mind, world, and audacity do you bring in the person who was like the second in charge, who really was in charge, let's just be real. Brenda Larson Mitchell was over operations. Before being operations, she was over, she was like the director of instruction. So she hasn't brought any results in that space. So why would we pick, um, why, would, why would someone be appointed as a superintendent, not an interim, as a superintendent to continue this madness. Obviously that sounds like an agenda to me. And then the kicker, here's the kicker in the uh, agenda item. If you read agenda item 20.2.03, not only does it say we're gonna appoint Brenda or we're gonna appoint her designee. What sense does that make? I about fell out. If I was in a bus, I would have fell out because what sense does that make? So what role? So here, here's a couple of questions that I have in all of this. One is, Jara, 
sport to stay in the district. The school board trustees did something I didn't even know you could do. Fire somebody and then rehire them back and then rehire them with more pay with a contract that if you want to fire them again, you would be forced to pay them millions of dollars. And at the time, Superintendent Jarvis says that he wanted to stay in the district. He wanted to um, he wanted to follow through with what he started so that he could bring a, about these fictional results. And that even I think he I think he even said he had a child and he wanted his child to grow up here. So that was about a year and a half ago. And then fast forward to now, when not only does he want to leave all of a sudden, but even though there's contractual obligations on how much notice he should give, the same school board trustees that brought him back after he was fired and gave him this very lucrative contract are now willing to say, no, you don't need to give us the full time notice. As a matter of fact, we're going to expedite your departure. Well, for someone that they wanted so bad, why are they willing to change the rules to for him to leave so quick? Sister Camila, I'm, I'm sort of like in the old Batman TV show, you know, when they had the Riddler and he'd say, riddle me this. I'm wanting somebody, please riddle me that. How do you go from firing, fighting back, I mean, fighting the public to rehire him, and then once he gets his potential tenure, then you're now going to escalate, advance his departure, and then pay him all of this money that he wouldn't have gotten paid had you not given him this very lucrative contract? Well, heck, makes me wonder, are they going to get a little kickback when he gets his big whopping $2 million check or whatever it is? Yeah, that's so in our community conversations, that has been the speculation. People, that's the question that the community has been asking. Is there going to be a kickback here? Something else, the, the community's thought is that something else is brewing and happening for this to be for so this agenda item on the um the work session tomorrow is 2.01 resignation of superintendent. And there is an amendment, an amendment to the employment agreement. And from what we've met, we have not seen an amendment of a contract during a board meeting, during the same time that a superintendent is resign resigning. So there are a lot of red flags there. Um, you know, soon we may know what, what, what the truth behind the resignation is, but you are bringing up some really good points. The four trustees fought hard to keep Superintendent Jari here. And I remember Superintendent Jari saying, I'm staying till 2026. It was in the, <laughs> yeah, I'm staying if you like it or not. It was in the paper and everything. So it really is a shocker. Um, and I do want to say that we have somebody really quick. Um, Chris, thank you for joining our um, our Facebook Live. I see you in the chat. And for those who are watching live, we thank you for joining. Um, if you have any comments, I know it's kind of quiet tonight. I thought there was going to be a little bit more <laughs> You know, people, but hey, anywho, I do want to uh, say one stance. Anna's coming in. I do want to say one thing. I don't agree that uh, Larson Mitchell agenda item 2.03 should be appointed as interim or a superintendent. Hey, Anna, go ahead and introduce yourself. You're on mute. Well, that's a good thing then, huh? No. <laughs> Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Anna Marie Binder. Um, I'm also running for Clark County School District Trustee District A. Um, and as many know, I love Ms. Bywaters. Looking forward to calling her doctor very soon, right? Um, yeah, if I can get through uh, the next step. <laughs> right, right. We have faith in you. We're Thank counting you. on you. How about that? <laughs> Um, and so just wanted to join this conversation tonight as well. And I apologize. I just had another meeting um, 
with the state. So I'm jumping in. I haven't caught most of what you were talking about. Um, so I'll kick back and listen for a minute and then um, join as appropriate. Yeah. So I think where we were, we kind of, I think the last part we made was um, Mr. Rodney was bringing up why there was such a, like a stronghold to keep the superintendent here. And then all of a sudden it's, hey, let's rush to get him out and give all these other types of options. But you know, you're welcome to join in whenever you want. And we definitely want to hear your perspective. You're running for um the board of school trustees. So yay, yay. Yeah, and and I haven't been really quiet about this. And I it wasn't that I was quiet when they fired and rehired them, you know, almost two years ago. But I really did kind of take a sidestep. As you know, there's not many of us who come forward when these types of things are happening uh, in our community. And so in um, 2021, when all of that was going on, I saw that as an opportunity to just kind of sit and listen. And I was not disappointed by our community who did show up. And so here we are, right? Um, we watched in 2022 when they rushed through uh, Superintendent Jara's evaluation just ahead of elections. And so here we sit in an election year again. And the feeling in my gut is they're trying to force whatever they're going to do in right now because Lola's announced she's not running again. We haven't heard from EGM, but she lost her job. Um, I don't know why, but she doesn't, even though she doesn't disclose it on her financial cam campaign disclosures, she does work for um, a community partner. And um, we don't know where Katie's going, right? Like she says she's not running again. We don't know. And then we have um, Trustee Guzman, my trustee, who has very much announced that she is not running again. And so the community has a really great opportunity right now to try to seize the moment, right? And if they are successful in appointing a permanent superintendent instead of an interim, what work is that going to mean for people like you and I? Um, if we are successful in our elections right. and our commitment to make change. So let's um, let's focus on that part for a minute, because the elections are not that far away to get a new um, a new school board. And if the current school board trustees, who some are not even going to run again, are going to pick the new trustee, it seems a little odd to me that people who won't even be there are going to use whatever methodology that they use to get the last person who we didn't want and now who's suddenly jetting on us, that they would probably use the same methodology to pick the next person. Or it's going to be a person very similar to the person that they previously picked. And then you and, and Camila Bywaters as new trustees would basically be stuck with the person that they wanted. And this is one of those cases where it seems like the right thing to do would be to appoint an interim. Now, who that interim is, that's a discussion. But as far as them selecting a permanent trustee, I think the people need to show up. They need to call, they need to email, they need to get on social media and say, leave that for the new board so that we in our school district, Clark County School District, the fifth largest in the nation, that is a troubled district, let's be honest about it. And a lot of that trouble has been associated with the administration and operation of the district, which is solely in the hands of the superintendent, that we need to give the new trustees an opportunity to devise what they believe is best for the district. Because after all, the people will have picked them to represent our district. So why would these outgoing trustees want to handicap the new trustees and make a decision for when this is an opportunity for major change and possibly and hopefully a positive change in the direction for the entire district? Sir Rodney, your statement's right there. 
allude to control, power, the exercise of power. And so just like we saw in 2022 in October, as we are seeing right now, it's who's in existing power attempting to tie the hands of those who might come into power. And so 2.03 also alludes to the Board of Trustees allowing Nicole Malich to negotiate uh, Brenda Larson Mitchell's contract with her or her designee. And so we also saw that as a huge um, issue the first time that Superintendent Jara's contract was renewed by and between Marianne Miller and his attorney years ago, and the board was left out of it. And so, and we haven't seen a draft of that agreement. We haven't seen what any of that would entail. And there, there's a lot, there's a lot, right, to unpack right here. So, Anna, I got a question about that. Because I remember Superintendent Jara gave his cabinet a fairly substantial pay raise. I, I want to say about $50,000, but I, I don't remember the exact number, but it, it was somewhere around 50, huge. Pay. Most people in the state don't even make $50,000, but he gave his staff a $50,000 pay raise. And so Brenda Larson Green, is she one of the beneficiaries of that large pay raise? Um, I'll have to go back and pull that, but if she's Brenda, within- Brenda Larson Mitchell, excuse Brenda, me. Yeah, sorry, Brenda Larson Mitchell, not green. Um, I'll pull that, but I believe she was because it was all of the um, upper executive cabinet members and she is one of them. And so that's when last legislative session, when we had, um, Time for 20, I always said in parentheses 27, because when I did the math on what our CFO, Jason Gowdy, got in those raises, he got a 27% raise. And so if the man handling the money can get a 27% raise, our educators, our staff, our, you know, our employees deserved a 27 at least percent raise, not 20. So even though we couldn't sell the 27, I always said time for 27 <laughs> on the back end of that. Um, but I, I've had reach out from more people like they're like, you know, BLM better than I do. Like, what are your thoughts on this? Right. I don't actually know BLM better than anyone. Um, but I will say that I've never been disrespected. I've never been um, pushed aside. She has always um, been very respectful to me in the spaces that I've encountered her. And so not being an educator, not working for them, I don't have that experience, right? Like I'm just a parent, I'm just a community member, I'm just an advocate. And so my dealings um, with her have been a lot different than right, than all of our, what, 40,000 employees. So, Sister Camila, let's hear something about what, what's your experience with some of those employees? How do they, how would they feel about the operations chief being the interim and possibly the permanent superintendent? Okay, so there's a couple things that I want to address, but for that question, since it's the initial question, many of the employees are absolute no. I'm saying it's been flooded into there are administrators who have said that if she is appointed as superintendent, they're leaving. Now, one thing that's important to know is that I'm not just pulling this out of like the sky or the heavens. Tracy and I and the work that we've done, it's really been important to us that we're on the inside <laughs> understanding what administrative from different levels are saying. And, uh, you know, so we, the student perspective and a family perspective. So it's not a good look in favor of her being um, the superintendent. Now, I and, and, and of course, there's both sides. Like there's people who've had great relationships with her and there's people who have not. Um, so 
that's just what it is for that. And we've been following her work since we've been following Superintendent Jara's work. But I did want to say earlier that we had talked about, um, and first of all, you know what? I never see her smile. And it was funny because I was in church the other day and the preacher was like, you ain't see, have you all seen them people that ain't never smile? I'm <laughs> like, this lady, and I just, I was like, this lady don't never smile. So come on now, but anywho. Um, she does smile. Just she does? Have you seen her smile? I haven't smile. seen her smile. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I apologize. She, she smiles sometimes. Um, I'll take that back. But one thing I wanted to say was about, um, we were talking about why would the board, why would the majority vote? Why would the majority or a few individuals want to have uh, th this? Why, why would they want to appoint a superintendent? So my initial thought was, and this is the perception, is that you don't want the district to thrive. Two, because both of these individuals have been in power. They've shown us the results. We've been going through this for the years that we've been going through this, and we have not seen significant improvements in our academic, our educational system. We just have not. Um, I did put a, a board attorney here, but um, my also my other thought was that exactly what um, Anna was saying is did they realize and understand that there's a shift in power happening? It's happening, period. <laughs> and this is an attempt, the perception is that this is an attempt to lock in those new trustees with the person they did not have an opportunity to engage the community around. For me, I thought that we were voted in by our community, our constituents, and that our responsibility, and it's a part of the um, board responsibility to engage the community. And this right here is a direct slap in the face to all of us. Hey, that I, yeah. Mr. Bywaters, what? when have we seen a community engagement? We have that. I, no, <laughs> we, we have it. Have, but we it's like, it. we haven't at all. Right. And I know that I've been begging, right? I beg all the time for that engagement. And we got a glimmer of it. And, and we got a really good glimmer of it three years ago. So at the last meeting, when they were talking about like setting up community meetings, I was just kind of laughing, right? Like, okay, we know how to do this. We know how to make them successful. Why are we talking about it again? But then Trustee Guzman kind of threw me off a little bit because she said that in the training that they received from, um, uh, I don't know if it was from Craybill or whatnot, but you know, part of that scam training that they're going through right now, that the meetings were supposed to be kind of modeled in a way for, um, Oh my gosh, I forget the term she used. It was more like um, campaigning versus community meetings. And so that really caught my attention because the school district in itself is not supposed to be campaigning, right? Uh, so I'm paying attention very closely to how they're going to roll out what they think are these community meetings over the next you know, couple months. Because as you all know, with election law is <laughs> this governmental agency is not to be hosting um, those types of events. So I don't know why she said that out loud. I haven't had an opportunity to speak with her about that, but that was very alarming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the point that I want to finish making was that the reality is is that we have not had an educational community that's been holistically engaged in education. You know, for years, Anna's been out there on the front line, even before um, me and Tracy got back in the loop, Anna was out there. That's actually how we met. I think we met on Facebook Live. <laughs> we met on Facebook Live and it's just been history since then. So for years we've been engaged and urging the community to like come out and be involved. So the reason I was talking about the engagement piece, because if there's no time that you have, if you have not been offended, be offended by this. And it is absolutely important that we're paying attention to who we're voting for. 
We are out here literally calling people's best friends to have them talk to they trustee best friend to get them to wake up and get off of planet Pluto. It should not be that difficult. <laughs> and, I, and it is so important as we're coming into 2024, like vet the candidates. And if you don't know who to vote for, ask someone who's engaged. Ask, ask, the, ask people who are involved in the community. And we have to be mindful, I have to check myself too, that these decisions that are being made are not about what's best for us on the outside. This is about what's best and who will be the best fit for our students. You know, how long, did, does anybody remember how long the search took to get Superintendent Jara in the first place? I want to say it was over the course of a solid eight months. And and I'm glad you said that because that's what I was thinking too. And I was doing the math. I don't know if you saw my fingers going, but I was doing the math. And I said, wow, there's eight months till the election. That's just enough time to do a search for a superintendent, a permanent superintendent, if we started now. If we look back at the past history on how long it's taken to get a superintendent. So to get one sooner than that, I'm not saying that it has to take that long, but just looking back at how long it has taken, that means we would have to use some type of accelerated process. And it's not that I'm against using an accelerated process, but I'm also starting to wonder, well, heck, if it took us eight months to get the guy that's trying to bail on us now, why would we want to try to condense that process? Now, and speaking but, of process, what are the requirements for hiring a superintendent? Aren't there certain procedures and practices that must be utilized according to the school board? Uh, there is. And what's really even deeper going on is right now we have a very divided community still. Um, I'm sure Camilla has seen as she's engaging um, her constituents here in Henderson, as most of you are familiar with, Henderson residents want out of Clark County School District. My constituents cannot understand why we can't just break apart. And that's a resonating statement that I'm getting from my constituents is well but right and i think you guys are seeing it too just break it up again right break it up break it up this is a good time to break it up and so i'm spending extra time once again <laughs> explaining to my constituents why that's not possible right now and then i lean back on the sentiments of replace the whole board and so right now we have four seats up right and so Anytime I'm seeing someone say replace the whole board, I'm responding. Four seats are up. We have that opportunity, right? The time is now. Let's get it, right? But like Camilla said, it's important that we have engaged voters who are researching the candidates, right? Because if we support the wrong candidate, we're going to wind up with the same four voting block that we've had for the five years. Um, and, and when you were saying that, I, I just want to touch on this real quick. They're saying that this is coming right now because the five-year plan, the Focus 24, 2024 plan that's been shoved down our throat for the last five years and hasn't gone anywhere that the vision of the district of the trust, you know, board of trustees vision is coming up on that five year plan. And they're looking at it not aligning anymore with what we've been working towards. So, so where did the five years go? Well, Anna, wouldn't that be even more reason to put this in sync with hiring a new superintendent? all this together with the new school board because these are going to be the people that has to administer um, this this future, whatever the processes are going to be. So it just seems odd that the outgoing school board is going to make the decisions and sort of hamstring 
the new, the incoming trustees. So I, I don't know where um, Camilla is on this, but whatever they choose to do, I don't have a hamstring. My hamstring is making sure that our community is met where they are. And if this exiting board thinks that they're going to tie someone like me down with their bad decisions, they're wrong. And I am willing to stand by that. Because look, if we would have fired and gotten rid of Jara years ago, we'd probably be in a different place right now. I will not allow someone to force me into eating their bad decision that's going to leave our educators, our students, and our communities five years behind, five years from now, because of something they're trying to do right now. Well, I, hey, I second and third that emotion yeah. because this is an this is an opportunity for us to have a fresh start. And I, I, I do, we need to foot stomp community involvement mm -hmm. because we do need community be, to be more involved. If you, these are your children. This is, these children belongs to uh, people in, like you said, Henderson. It belongs to people here in Las Vegas, in North Las Vegas, uh, even Mesquite. These are all a part of the CCSD. Excuse me, but we don't see that representation at these school board meetings. And, you know, if, if you don't show up, Excuse me, if you don't show up, it's almost saying to the board that you agree with whatever they do and you're okay with, it. as a matter of fact, board, you're doing just fine. Right, <laughs> right. That Excuse that me. seems to be the sentiment to me because um, I've heard elected officials say, well, my constituents aren't emailing me. I've heard people, I've heard elected officials say, and I'm thinking, that don't mean they don't care. <laughs> That just means you let yourself off the hook from doing the work to inform the people about what's going on. That's what that means to me. Um, I, I did want to shout out some people really quick who are on with us. Cherie, thank you for joining us on, on the um, Facebook Live. Thank you, Miss um, Belinda. Thank you. And then also Pastor West for joining us on the live. But that's how I think about it. And, and, and how I think of, I, I am a public servant. Period. Me running for the board of trustees is not for myself. I've already been doing this work for free 50 free for <laughs> years. <laughs> okay. Free 50 free for years. So, um, and people may not know, but Lavapsi started in 1989. Um, there was, and we had our ebbs and flow. Tracy and I restarted it in 2010. And then I left and moved. And then we restarted again in 2020. So this has been a labor of love and has been work and years of getting to this place and working and engaging in the community and being a part of education. This has been years. And Anna can let you know how many, how long she's been advocating for students with disabilities, for her own child. We've been doing this for a year. We didn't just pop up and say, hey, we're here and don't know what an agenda item looks like. No, we've been doing this. And but that's what, that's what's that. already setting us apart. Like people are talking about that, Camilla, is who's right. And I said this last cycle. Remember, I was so frustrated uh, the last time because I was like, oh, look at all these people coming out of nowhere, trying to run, except Brenda. You know what I mean? That haven't been here, that haven't shown up, that aren't doing the work. And fortunately, Brenda did get elected in and she did an amazing job. Um, but we have people like you and I trying to run, like, right? I don't work. You guys know that. I haven't made a dime in years. I volunteer every minute of my day for this community, for our state. Um, and that really is something worth saying, right? And then you you look at Tracy and you look at her family and you look at the Lavopsy movement. These aren't things that happened overnight, right? And huh, maybe we don't have a TikTok page with 10,000 followers. Maybe we need to fix that, <laughs> you know? 
Um, but people tend, you know, we're headline people, right? Like um, most people read the headlines. If it's a catchy headline, they just, they don't read it. They move along. And, and for years now, I've gotten the blowback um, from a lot of people that say like, well, most people don't have time to be involved in this stuff, right? Like they're raising their children, they're working, they're putting dinner on the table. Well, we are too, right? I mean, Camilla, you got two beautiful young children, right? You guys all know I've been raising my own six kids. Um, we are doing the same exact Ooh. things, except the priorities for the betterment of our children and our children's children have been on the forefront for many years. And the time is now to make change. Yeah. And you know what? Speaking of the kids, them people used to go in on me at them school board meetings. They're like, why is she out there at 12 a.m.? And her daughter right there. I'm like, yeah, I was out there at 12. I was, y'all. <laughs> but then they started. And I was very blessed that I had. Right. <laughs> and I was very blessed that I had older, you know, older teenagers in the house that would help me and my husband. So. Um, I, I don't think I've ever brought one of my kids to a board meeting, but my kids have very much watched me over the years and, um, they know, um, some of my son, my, my nonverbal autistic son, some of his first words were when schools reopen, when we were on the way to school for the first time and in the back seat, I'm going to cry on the way to school that first day, he said, mommy fought for legend. And I, I honestly will never forget it. I wish I had it on video, but that means Camilla, he was listening. He couldn't talk, but he was listening and he found those words, right? And this is why we fight. And this is why we show up. Yeah. And I do want to say that Jane is on Facebook live and she said, People are not going to engage if they perceive themselves as having no voice or impact. And that's what we've been experiencing. Absolutely. The community has been so shut out. I mean, look, they call us what? What was the new one? Onlookers. Um, I know that Trustee Brooks has been responding to some of her constituents with um, some, some of the same language that I know you've heard as well, Camilla, over the years. Um, the people who care are here, right? Just because somebody can't show up doesn't mean they don't care. Right. But they do rely on people like us who are consistent in showing up and speaking for them. And as long as we have leadership that looks at the community as a nuance instead of a partnership, the people in our community that are most affected by their decisions are going to continue to not show up or voice their opinions because they don't think it matters. But you know what I'm going to say, Jane? Watch this. Tomorrow night, watch this. Because I'm telling you, our community tomorrow night is coming out so strong and so much in tune with each other about what we need for right now. I don't know the outcome of tomorrow, but I know that our community will be there and it's more than onlookers. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned that mm -hmm. because for years, this district has had an issue with parental involvement. And both of you are running for school board. Both of you are parents. Both uh, Camila has grown up through this district. She attended. And so one of the questions that I get a lot is, why aren't more people engaged? And is there anything that the trustees can do to help people feel like they do have a voice? As an example, Sister Camila has this program here every Tuesday night to actively engage with the community to have a back and forth so she can share her thoughts and the community can share thoughts with her. Uh, as far as I know, no one else is doing this. She said that she would do it once she, once she gets elected. And I think that's a step in the right direction. But as a collective board, what do you think the board can do to bring about the community 
feeling comfortable and sort of invite them in to show them that they have a say. As an example, we know that the laws for the meetings have changed and who can speak and how long they can speak, those types of things. What type of plans do you all have to bring back more community involvement, even at the school board meetings? Um, Anna, you want to start? I was going to let you start, but whatever you want. I, I think you and I are on a very um, parallel path yeah. on our visions and our ideas. So um, I have been, most people who know me know that censure policy is going to be the first to burn. Tell them what that is. Okay, so the Clark County School District Board of Trustees passed a governance policy that the trustees are to speak as one voice. It's part of the Silver State governance um, that individual trustees are not basically to speak out to constituents, media, anybody. Um, they're supposed to support the vote of the whole of the board. You know, basically no pushback. Um, they've also created policies where the trustees cannot ask a question unless it's been asked in a private session and they are prepared to answer. And so first and foremost for community engagement, um, I think most people who know me know I can't be censured. I will always be available to my community. I will always be available. I will always speak. And that's something that since it's disappeared, I didn't realize how much I appreciated it, right? Like years ago, whether you liked it or not, we had trustees that would push back, ask the hard questions. We don't get any of that anymore, right? And so you're more than welcome to reach out to your trustee with your question. They'll get back to you, but the public doesn't get to hear that concern. The public doesn't get to hear that answer. And so it, it's just got to go. Like you're an elected official. You're there to represent the people. If you cannot at all speak, then what are you sitting in that seat for? Okay. All right. Thanks, Anna. So we see we got a fighter in Anna and she, one of her targeted goals getting in is going to be attack that governance policy and make sure that uh, it's, more uh, conducive to engage community engagement. Sister Camila, do you have any thoughts on what you can do to bring about more community involvement and even make the community have a little more trust that you actually want to hear what they have to say? Absolutely. Um, I do want to say that Tamika Henry is um, joined in on Facebook Live. If she's able to come in the Zoom, she will. Um, but I agree with Anna. I think there needs to be, because even if you look at the dates, if you look at the dates of the policies and the clock of the trustees, it's like, okay, this is old school. This is out of date. So I would like to advocate for, you know, reviewing the policy and ensuring like what works for our community, what works for a new board, right? Um, and also engagement and community is, is my heart. There's no way I could do this work without understanding and knowing and being with the community. I continue to say that I don't want to be a person who speaks for the community. I want to be a person that speaks with the community. And I was actually really disheartened um, some months ago when I heard um, some older former trustees saying that as a trustee, you don't really have to go to your schools. And I was like, that kind of like, did I like a little try to keep my face together, but I don't understand that at all. And there are like, and there are policies that have made that really tight for trustees. I plan to be, now I'm not going to be over here micromanaging. No, but I do want to know what's going on. Is the superintendent that was hired by the trustees doing right by you? Are they caring for you? Do you feel valued, respected, and safe in your workplace? One thing that is important to me is a, a inclusive, positive climate and culture. I but cannot stand provide that for the principals first. 
And if as a trustee, if our duty is to, you know, oversee the superintendent, if that superintendent isn't providing that space for the principals, how can the pr principals provide that to our, our, our local school sites? Right. And we hear that conversation all the time about bad admin, good admin, you know what I mean? And people don't quit. for no reason. They quit because of bad admin, bad bosses, bad working environments. And we have to change that. We deserve that. Yeah. And let me finish my statements really quick. Um, I plan to be engaged and involved with schools. I do plan to, um, whatever, whatever we decide is whatever the protocols are, I will follow those, of course, but I plan to be engaged with the schools that are in District E. I plan to do community events in District E and to ensure that the community has access to me, students have access to me, the school community, principals, administration will have access to me because I want to be involved and know that everything is okay. And I'm, you know, and so I'll just stop there, but climate and culture is very important to me. It is okay. to me. And I so know we're down to our last two minutes. It, so to we me. may want to um, start wrapping up and prepare our closing remarks so we can get it all in and end on time so everybody can go back to their dinner and to their children, get them ready for school tomorrow. Yeah, I'll just go. I mean, I feel those sediments exactly. There's already language in the governing policies for community engagement. They have not been followed. Um, and I mean, really, I, honestly, I don't think it's a huge conversation to be had, Camilla. Go out. Let's do it because it's already there. We shouldn't have to fight for it. We don't need approval. If, if you're elected or I'm elected, I plan on doing the same exact thing because we're here and this is what we're here for. And there's no, I don't think any doubt in the people who support us that know that our intentions are true to that. Right. Absolutely. Definitely agree. And then my final remarks will be that um, tomorrow, I mean, the community has done a phenomenal job of advocating for um, what they wanted for tomorrow's work session. And I think we're going to be really surprised um, The when, when the community shows up and shows out and demands what is it they want to see and put pressure on people, things may change. So we'll see tomorrow what's going to happen. Um, yeah, it's a big day. And I'm really proud to hear that the emails were flooded. People were making phone calls and this conversation was happening. Um, I think we're, we've made a really good impact. Um, yep. Tomorrow... Yeah, that meeting is tomorrow here in my city of Henderson, city council yeah. chambers at four o'clock. Um, that's over on Water Street. You can just Google it. It's on board docks um, and it's available online. I will um, I will be in the room. I will be live streaming from my Spill in the CCSDT page. Um, and I really, really look forward to everyone in the community who's devoting the time to show up um, for the future of our public education system tomorrow. Okay, everybody. Well, Sister Camila, it looks like we're coming pretty near to the end of our show. I know you said you want to try to start it on time. You want to try to shut <laughs> it down on time. Yeah, we did um, pretty good today. <laughs> so, and, and I'm going to say when you all get there, can you mm -hmm. make sure that there's some volume with the live streaming that comes like it used to be where we can actually hear what people are saying and and okay. maybe even see do who's doing in, the talking. They do that intentionally to um, prevent people from actually listening in. So um, Stephen Phillips has been scrubbing sound and then re-posting um, meetings because the sound quality is so terrible. But since we're in chamber councils tomorrow, there shouldn't be an audio quality. Uh, okay. city and Chambers should be really good. I can't account for like my live stream but I'll try to be up as close as possible, like to a speaker. Um, but otherwise the YouTube, the EDU vision, uh, we just don't get to interact with each other when we stream on those devices. But mm -hmm. anyway, so I will get some sound checks on mine and try to do the best I can do just from a live stream per, uh, you know, point of view. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. All right. 
So we didn't get any uh, questions or comments from the folks in Facebook Live today, or did I miss them? We did not. We had some comments. Well, the comments that were given, Jane had some comments, but that was about it. We talked about those. Okay. All right. Well, it, it is coming. Uh, it is seven o'clock. So, Sister Camila, how do you want to proceed? You want to give her a chance to go around the room, or do you just yeah. want to close? We, let's do go around the room. Um, Martin, did you have any final words? And Miss Amy and the general? So, yes, just, just, just actually, you know, I look forward to being present in person tomorrow for, for this conversation. So I, I will be there. Um, I would like to discuss this a little bit more offline because I would like to see if we can continue this conversation uh, on my on my um, uh, Thursday night presentation. So awesome. same, same people that are in this in this room right now and anyone else you think uh, would, would be good so that my audience can also um, hear this conversation and hopefully be motivated to be more involved. Okay, um, what time and where, it, Martin? So, so I, 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 it's every second Thursday, but this month is already taken care of, so we can talk offline on, on some logistics. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Sister Amy, did you have any anything? Not really. I just appreciate the fact that uh, both Anna and Camilla made it very clear that parents need to go to the schools if they have a problem and don't wait till it's, it's out of control. I don't know, we used to call them parent-teacher meetings or whatever, and I always found that it was very hard to get people to attend those meetings. So, and that's the, you get the principal's ear when you attend those meetings. Okay. Thank you. Uh, General, did you have any comments for us? No, not, not really. I do agree with Miss Amy. Parents need to uh, get on board and uh, open up and uh, speak their mind, meet with the teachers. Uh, as well as come to the uh, Clark County School Board meetings. I'm hoping tomorrow that people will be very open, very honest, and express themselves fully as to how they feel about what's going on and ask significant questions and expect answers. Okay, and um, Amy, if or excuse me, Anna, if you can uh, give some closing remarks and also repeat the location and time of the meeting. Okay, sure. Um, just in closing, just, uh, you know, the echo. Uh, I, I know Camilla and I and you, Sir Rodney, we are constantly advocating to our community to speak up, show up, email, like hit us up if you don't know where to go, right? Like we're good at pointing you in the right direction or, or helping facilitate um, what's going on. And so the more engaged we are as a community, the further we get. And so I'll just leave with that. I want the engagement, right? Um, and then, yes, yeah, so tomorrow's work session is at four o'clock at the city of Henderson city council chambers. It's on water street. I think if you just Google it, it'll pop right up or whatever your maps are. Uh, but it does begin sharply at four o'clock. And please note that the entrance to this venue is a little sharper than like uh, the Ed shed or other venues. So security, um is is really thorough so sometimes it takes a minute you know to get through security to go into the chambers uh so please allow yourself a little bit extra time ahead of four o'clock to get there get you know get through screening get seated get your public comment card filled out and if you haven't already you can call 702-799-1072 before give them give it to them again Yes, 702-799-1072. That is the number to the board meeting office. You can sign up ahead of time, but you have to call like right at a, uh, right at a, either leave a message overnight uh, or call very first thing in the morning, but you have to sign up eight hours ahead of time and the meeting's at four o'clock tomorrow. So if you go ahead, call in tonight, leave a voicemail, put your name, number, what you want to speak on, they'll put you on the list ahead of time. So you're not in a hurry when you get there tomorrow to get your public speaker card in. Um, I stay up by the door uh, tomorrow where those cards are to help direct people on how to fill those out and where to turn them into um, ahead of the meeting. Oh, that's okay. good. Thanks, Anna. And Thanks. Sister Camila Bywarders running for school. 
school district trustee seat E, um, who has this venue to practice doing what she's going to do once she gets elected, and that's have open forums and engagements with her constituents. If you could close us out. Absolutely. Did you want to say something before we go? Uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part. Okay. <laughs> thank you for um, engaging in this with me, because I really appreciate it. I know you always ask um, thought-provoking questions that I think are important to challenge me. So I love that. But thank you everyone for joining our conversation tonight. Um, we missed last Tuesday. Glad to see you this Tuesday. Thank you for all those who joined. And I do want to say really quick that Pastor West said that when he was on, he served on the state board um, once for family engagement, and he cannot say enough or loud enough that we do need parents to speak up. So I wanted to make sure I acknowledge um, Pastor's comment but thank you everyone for joining us. We're really glad you were able to engage with us and have an opportunity to see Anna and I. We're both running for the school board. I'm running for the board of school district. I am running for the board of school trustees in district E. Anna's running in what letter? Uh, a. District A. So we appreciate your support. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you next week for the next hottest topic. Everyone have a wonderful evening.